years ago, the Arabs had used the Ptolemaic hypothesis to make machines or models of the planetary system purely for the purpose of calculation. Our collective representations were born when people began to take the models, whether geometrical or mechanical, literally. The machine is geometry and motion, and the new picture of the heavens as a real machine was made possible by parallel developments in physics, where the new theory of inertia had assumed for the first time in the history of the world that bodies can go on moving indefinitely without an animate or psychic mover. The whole point of a machine is that for as long as it goes on moving, it goes on by itself without man's participation. To the extent, therefore, that the phenomena are experienced as machine, they are believed to exist independently of man, not to be participated, and therefore not to be in the nature of representations. We have seen that all of these beliefs are fallacious. At the beginning of the 18th century, the variety of natural species was normally attributed, by the botany and zoology of the day, to supernatural and instantaneous creation. The 18th and 19th centuries witnessed the almost total disappearance of this tradition in favour of a gradual evolution. In the record of the rocks and the dovetailed panorama of organic nature, history and science together gradually divined the vestiges of a different, a natural kind of creation, and one that was the reverse of instantaneous. Nature herself came to be seen as a process in time, and the individual phenomena at any moment, instead of being fixed, were cross-sections of their own development and metamorphosis. What were the phenomena of nature at that time when the new doctrine began to take effect, and particularly at that Darwinian moment in the middle of the 19th century? They were objects. The phenomena were unparticipated to a degree which has never been surpassed before or since. The habit, begun by the scientific revolution, of regarding the mechanical model constructed by alpha thinking as the actual and exclusive structure of the universe, had sunk right into them. What, then, had Alpha Thinking achieved at precisely this point in the history of the West? It had temporarily set up the appearances of the familiar world as things wholly independent of man. It had clothed them with the independence and extrinsicality of the unrepresented itself. But a representation, which is collectively mistaken for an ultimate, ought not to be called a representation. It is an idol. Thus the phenomena themselves are idols when they are imagined as enjoying that independence of human perception which can in fact only pertain to the unrepresented. And it was to these collective representations that the evolutionists had to apply their alpha thinking. Is it to be wondered at that the evolution which they've depicted is not a real evolution of phenomena at all, but a fictitious extrapolation? an evolution of idols. I am speaking, of course, of the form which the theory finally took, not of the concept of evolution itself. That is factual enough. The record of the rocks is a script containing stored memories of Earth's past. It is only a question of how the script is to be read. A touch of that participation which still linked the Greeks and even the medieval observer with their phenomena might well have led to a very different interpretation, as it did in the case of Goethe, who had that touch. But for the generality of men and women, participation was dead, and they could no longer conceive of any manner in which either growth itself or the metamorphosis of individual and special growth could be determined from within. The appearances were idols. They had no within. Therefore, the evolution which had produced them could only be conceived mechanomorphically, as a series of impacts of idols on other idols. I shall have succeeded very poorly if I haven't made one thing plain. It is only necessary to take the first feeble steps towards a renewal of participation that is, the bare acknowledgement in beta-thinking that phenomena are collective representations, 
in order to see that the actual evolution of the Earth we know must have been at the same time an evolution of consciousness. For consciousness is correlative to phenomena. Any other picture we may form of evolution amounts to no more than a symbolic way of depicting changes in the unrepresented. Yet, curiously enough, as already observed, this latter kind of evolution, that is, changes in the unrepresented, is just what is assumed not to have taken place. By treating the phenomena of nature as objects wholly extrinsic to man, with an origin and evolution of their own independent of man's evolution and origin, 19th century science and 19th century speculation succeeded in imprinting on the minds and imaginations of men and women their picture of an evolution of idols. One result of this has been to distort very violently our conception of the evolution of human consciousness. Or rather, it has caused us virtually to deny such an evolution in the face of what otherwise must have been accepted as unmistakable evidence. The object of this book is to demonstrate on general grounds the necessity of smashing the idols. The idols are tough and hard to crack but through the first real fissure we make in them, we find ourselves looking how deeply into a new world. The first glimpse we now get is of the familiar world and human history lying together, bathed in the light of the evolution of consciousness.